Hardy. While kids' cartoons can be dark, adult cartoons? They can be a blackness beyond the darkest pitch. These are the cartoon episodes that you can't be old enough to watch. Once we become adults, the training wheels truly come off in darkness. No punches are pulled as we're confronted with torture, Money! mental illness, annihilation, the fragility of our own perceptions, and the loss of everything that makes us who and what we are. But you and I are here in this moment, and no matter how dark, we're facing it together. So let's check out the top 10 darkest adult cartoon episodes. Just a heads up for younger and more sensitive viewers, we'll be discussing some adult, dark concepts in this video. So for younger viewers, I either recommend you skip this episode or watch this top list with an adult who cares about you. Anyway, on to the countdown. You are a rotten little cog, mon frere, spun by forces you don't understand. Nutshack, the slasher episode. When I think dark, I don't tend to think nutshack. I tend to think more unnecessarily stupid violence and frat boy smutty jokes. The show was never gory though, but this episode has parts in it that are so unapologetically violent and over the top that it feels like we suddenly switched over to a slasher horror instead. While the show's never been known for its uh, highly insightful writing or thoughtful dialogue, this episode, it has so much insanity going on in it that it's like some fascinating cosmic anomaly. Tonight, in the world of Nutshack, we see our hero Jack's doppelganger turn into a mad and deranged serial killer that seems to get his kicks from slicing up the show's entire cast like sushi rolls. Oh no! How shall we go on without, uh, poor random Indian stereotype? Jeepers, that guy was offensive. Is there anyone here? Big booty horse? Jack does these kills, honestly, in some really twisted and horrifying ways. By a comedy show standards anyway. Burning them alive, smushing them with a car, and slicing their bodies up like Swiss cheese. With the already abysmally limited budget we can expect from that check, this lunatic's mass murder spree gives off a surprisingly uncanny vibe. Then there's a side plot where characters swap bodies and it's all just as convoluted and out of place as the robot cat monkey abomination snarky remarks. The slasher is a fine example of trying to be edgy and dark without providing any actual context that should go along with it. It's a dark episode, but dark certainly doesn't make it a good episode. You are a rotten little cog, mon frere. The Simpsons, Homer's enemy. You're what's wrong with America, Simpson. If you lived in any other country in the world, you'd have starved to death long ago. He's got you there, Dad. Oh, boy. I watched this episode once when I was a child, and have since skipped over it for the last 20 years. There's few characters on The Simpsons who have had a fate as cruel as Frank Grimes. From the day this guy was born, he was hit with nothing but misfortune. And when he meets Homer, he begins to lose his mind over how unfair life has been to him, and how easy it's been for someone like Homer. Look at me! I'm a worthless employee, just like Homer Simpson! Until eventually, he completely loses his sanity and ends up dying through electric shock. I don't necessarily think this is a bad episode, but this is certainly the most mean-spirited Simpsons episode we've ever gotten. And it seems to be void of any message beyond some people are doomed to be miserable, no matter what they do, or how hard they work. In an our meritocracy-driven Western society, that can be an understandably tough pill to swallow. It's interesting to note, though it may seem like Homer was the one to cause Frank's life to become excruciatingly difficult, Homer was never actually cruel to him. If anything, we get a slightly more friendly, wide-eyed version of Homer, but his mere existence being possible seemed to push Grimes over the edge. Unlike Treehouse of Horror, there's no sense of fantasy to this episode. Frank's on-screen death feels chillingly real and it realistically shows to an outsider how Homer's life can completely shatter the American ideology of right and wrong. It gets even more dark when the entire family sits by his grave and just laughs his entire legacy away. What's most discomforting to me about this is it all feels surprisingly plausible that this could happen to someone. But hey, Frank is remembered by all of us now, so I guess he's actually got a pretty well-known legacy. You are a rotten little cog, mon frere. American Dead. The American Dad After School Special. It's no secret that, young or old, society puts a lot of pressure on people in terms of their appearance. 
While beauty is something that is entirely subjective, many people still often feel obligated to try and meet those crazy standards of attractive. Which, as Stan shows, doesn't always lead to a healthy lifestyle. In fact, it can lead to a deadly lifestyle. I know, I'm a huge tub of lard. No, you aren't! You're just suffering from a delusional state! In this episode, we tackle the subject of anorexia, as Stan finds himself critically judging his son's girlfriend's weight, and in the end, being in denial as his body begins to die from starvation. You're sick and you need help! And you're uncommonly strong! There are no punches held as we see the disturbing disfigurement eating disorders can cause in people, and honestly, how these obsessive compulsive behaviours of over-exercising and skipping meals can sneak up on a person until they can't even see their own emaciated bodies. It even reaches the point where Stan starts hallucinating a fitness coach that keeps pushing him to lose weight to even more dangerous levels. And his loved one's desperate attempts to help him only drive him to starve and exercise himself more. But it's only when Stan realizes what matters is whether you're happy with yourself or not, does he start trying to actually become himself again. Sadly, in reality, this isn't a normal mental disorder that's solved in one determined bread-eating effort. In fact, it has the highest death rate of any mental disorder. But despite this, anorexia is a subject that you rarely see get touched upon in animation. And I certainly hadn't expected American Dad to dedicate an entire episode to it. But American Dad handles this issue with an unexpected grace and realism. And if Seth had any involvement in this episode, I applaud him for it. When you watch this episode for the first time, the contrast between Stan's mental image of himself and what his family sees may come off as crass, but this is 100% accurate to how anorexia can damage people's perception. You could look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself as a fatty, even if your rib cage is showing. Anorexia goes far deeper than a passing fad, and I was glad to see American Dad talking about it. If you're happy, I'm happy. Are a rotten little cog, mon frere. Rick and Morty. Autoerotic assimilation. That's horrible! I hear you, man. Honestly, what episode of Rick and Morty isn't dark with a callous disregard for the value of sentient life? Even Rick's escape episode treats humanity like cattle lined up for slaughter. <laughs> While I don't personally think this makes the show smart or mature, Rick and Morty can certainly be dark, nihilistic, and cruel. But more on that later. Autoerotic Assimilation is the darkest episode to me for two reasons. For one, the entire concept of free will is dumped upon pretty badly. And secondly, Rick's decision at the end. Rick's ex-girlfriend Unity is a hive mind that has taken over the minds of every sentient being on the planet. But what's creepiest is, this show does some logical gymnastics to paint this as a good thing for the population. Despite the fact that every being on this planet has never been even given the right to suffer with their own consciousness, Unity's twisted them into productive drones, so that makes it okay to her. World peace achieved. Nice. We get an overblown message that sentience will immediately create anarchy upon given any free will. So they're apparently better off as a hive mind? I guess this comes back to Rick and Morty's fundamental philosophy. Some people call it cosmic pessimism, but I think cosmic nihilism is a more suitable term. What bothers me most is people considering Rick and Morty's philosophy smart or edgy. There's few intelligent, basically scientifically educated human beings that aren't aware what a transient, insignificant speck in the endless blackness we are. But what we try to do is acknowledge that, while also making the most of this brief flicker of consciousness we happen to have. Not just constantly calling everything meaningless. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Being allowed to be in the moment and appreciate this simultaneously horrifying and beautiful universe of chaos for everything it is. To the best we are each able, and being there for one another as much as we're able to within that chaos. Compare this to Bojack. Bojack doesn't try to become happier because he thinks life has a more practical purpose than existing in the moment. He tries to become happier despite who and what we are. He tries this because he wants his time on Earth to have some human warmth, contentment, and satisfaction. Why waste it on being miserable and living through the perception that our world's meaningless? And jeebus forbid, maybe Bojack might want to accidentally forget the practicalities of being alive for a moment and simply enjoy the moment. 
In this way, I actually think Rick and Morty is considerably less emotionally mature than BoJack will ever be, but that's just my opinion. But all that aside, autoerotic assimilation is dark because it questions the fundamental meaning of our free wills. And this is the one time we saw Rick's misery get so bad that he attempted suicide. It makes for a very dark Rick and Morty episode. Fun's fun, but who needs it? I'll be in the garage. You are a rotten little cog, mon frere. Family Guy, screams of silence. Let's waste this dick. This episode only has to be seen once to get stuck in your memory like an uncomfortable zit becoming only uglier with age. As about one in four women and one in seven men have been injured as a result of domestic violence, there's very few men or women this episode won't rub the wrong way. Though done with earnesty from the characters. Brenda, I love you. Please make the right decision. This episode sends strange mixed messages about killing criminals, mixed with odd advice on dealing with domestic violence, and a hint of victim blaming thrown in. Plus, she kinda is garbage, Quagmire. Complete with slow, uncomfortable strangle scenes. I choke myself every day, you bastard. I guess this episode shows that even an earnest attempt to send a message can be botched up and toxic in the wrong hands. And Seth MacFarlane's hands simply aren't capable of handling this topic. There's little ways to describe this episode beyond ugly. It's a very chilling depiction of some very real horrors of domestic violence. <laughs> Living is a bitter, nasty slog, my hair. Why not sell your sadness as a friend? King of the Hill, Pygmalion. Whoa, what the? This is King of the Hill, right? The cartoon about the redneck family facing basic life issues? This infamous episode was originally intended to be a season five Halloween special, but was outright banned by Fox for two years. Why was it banned? Well, a few reasons, but a lot of it was this. Ah! King of the Hill does have some unexpectedly dark moments throughout the series, but this episode really stepped into a league of its own. It's funny that with all the Simpsons Halloween specials gory moments, it never felt as brutally real as this. Because unlike the Simpsons, there's no element of fantasy to what's happening in King of the Hill. Pygmalion feels very real as Peggy and Luann witness a mentally unstable man skewered and mutilated by a pig slaughter machine. As well as this, the episode has a lot of references to pretty brutal animal kills, confronting viewers with the complicated lines between our basic dietary guidelines and the first world dilemma of whether to eat animals. <sighs> Existence is complicated. It starts off innocently enough, with Peggy being overly protective towards her niece Luann, quitting Luann's job for her. Unfortunately, her new job turns out to be with a deranged pork manufacturing entrepreneur named Trip. Hank and Peggy quickly pick up that Trip has more than a raise in mind for their niece. Oh, you mean sex? No, uh, no, 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 definitely no. Yes. And soon, Trip starts controlling Luann in some very uncomfortable ways, such as dressing her up in servant costumes, and leaving the hills guillotine pigs on their front lawn. The weirdo scumbag even drugs Luann's drink and dyes her hair in her sleep. And this all leads up to Trip, Luann, and Peggy all getting trapped in the slaughterhouse, resulting in Trip being skewered alive, with his body implied to be bloody and mangled. Oh, fun fact though, Trip was actually voiced by Michael Keaton, aka Batman. I'm Batman. Neat, huh? I feel like Batman would have just rolled off the conveyor belt though, not just sat there. The sinister moments of this episode are off the charts. Seeing Luann go from completely enthralled by Trip's promises to being trapped inside his revolted twisting dream world is genuinely frightening. And the control Trip forces upon Luann is very uncomfortable to see. Don't you see? We can have it all. We can be the family in the picture. Pygmalion is certainly the darkest King of the Hill episode we've ever gotten. Moral Oral, Alone. Moral Oral is a very real cartoon. 
It can be ruthlessly cynical, but tragically earnest at the same time. I think you know who makes the rules for such a thing as praying. Oh, of course. That's right, a bunch of random guys. The show stars a young boy named Oral, who has to use his wits to survive as best as he can in the stringently religious town of Oralton. It explores many of those uncomfortable human experiences we might have had on a daily basis, but rarely discuss or fully explore with others. In fact, Moral Oral had such an uncomfortably realistic edge that it's one of those cartoons that I don't feel all adults are old enough to watch. Some people even labeled it the most depressing adult swim show of all time. There's some Belief that this is actually why Adult Swim cancelled the show. But perhaps the episode that hit the bleakest tone of all was Alone, focusing on some of the women's alone time in this oppressive town. Part of what is so dark and unpleasant about Alone is it captures that sense of silence and aloneness that many of us feel while we're on our own, and some of those sad moments we can have by ourselves when no one else is watching. Wow, my eye is really sweating up a storm here. Okay, let's see as well as some gut-wrenching objectification of women. It heavily captures that sense of anxiety from panic attacks, post-traumatic stress disorder, and rumination on our darkest terrors. And honestly, this moment actually made my stomach churn it was so horrifyingly real to me. You can see her fighting against her anxiety, against herself, and that obsessive compulsive urge to recheck that lock, to not follow through on that compulsion over and over again, followed by another gut punch implying forced violation of this woman. OCD affects about 2-3% to of the world's population, and it can absolutely cripple the lives of those affected. But like this episode shows, so much of these inner fights are ones we are fighting alone, and it can often feel like we have to take on these fights alone. For me anyway, some of my most terrifying, isolated moments are the ones I've had alone, and this Moral Oral episode captures that really well. So well that I had to stop the episode a couple of times to take a breather. Mr. Pickles. Coma. In the first season anyway, just about everything this cartoon does is offensive and dark. Not necessarily in a clever, mature way though. Mutilation, psychopathic mass murder, ugh, it's, it's just vile. For the first season anyway, the episode that probably made my skin crawl the most was Coma, where Tommy's father Stanley falls into a coma, causing himself to hallucinate himself as a human in a dog's mind. There you are, Mr. Goodman! Uh, call me Dad Tommy. <laughs> What's that, boy? Huh? I probably only have to show you a little of these scenes for you to immediately realize how uncomfortable comfortable, humiliating, and disturbing this is to witness. And all the time while poor Stanley is going through this nightmare, his psychopathic doctor is planning to secretly kill him and harvest his organs while he's in a coma. Well, I'm working on a patient in a coma. He'll be ready for harvesting soon. Though honestly, when I looked ahead, I was actually pleasantly surprised by season two. My favorite of what I saw was the vegan episode, which had probably the strangest Weird Al cameo I've ever seen. Did somebody order a vegan pizza? If people are interested in the future, I may actually do a real thoughts on season two and three. Drawn together, lost in the parking space. Ah, drawn together, you never fail to disappoint us in giving us something horrifying to look at. I really am perfectly noosted! Finding a dark episode of Drawn Together is like finding an offensive episode of Modern Family Guy. You're kind of overwhelmed with choice. And Drawn Together isn't just a show that offends, it moons the Queen, while simultaneously flipping off the Statue of Liberty at the same time. But perhaps the most memorably horrifying episode is Lost in the Parking Space. A two-parter where we see the Drawn Together crew slowly go insane, cannibalizing one another. Hey, anyone want to trade Ling Ling and lobster sauce for Mushu Ling Ling? No thanks, I'm stuffed. While we also see just about every cartoon character we hold dear for the last 50 years tortured and killed. This is men's fault. Even Princess Clara goes on a genocidal rampage, believing the local delivery guy to be Satan. Cartoon characters are brutally mutilated. Davia and Goliath imply violation of one another. That wasn't about love, Goliath. It was about power. 
As usual, no punches are ever held in this maniacal cartoon. This episode's just a marvel to behold, really. Offending probably every cartoon viewing demographic ever conceived. I don't know how one cartoon can be so horribly dark, yet leave me smiling so much at the same time. But like any drawn together episode, it certainly should be taken with several heaping bowls of salt. And before we get to number one, just a couple of quick honorable mentions. Castlevania. It's hard to pick out one specific episode of this show since pretty much every episode is bleak in a dark, gothic setting. While there tend to be some darker themes explored through its entirety, such as poverty, religious exclusivity, and questioning the value of life, these are pretty constant throughout the entire series. Rick and Morty, Rick Potion 9. This episode just gets darker and darker with each passing minute, from the entire world craving Morty's body after getting jazzed up on Rick's oxytocin virus, disfiguring them into Mantis, and then into the ultimate revulsion mutant Cronenbergs. The darkest part about this episode is probably the ending, though, where Rick and Morty have to bury their dead parallel universe counterparts. We witness here probably the most scarring moment for Morty that he ever goes through. South Park episode 200 and 201. I left these off the list since I've discussed them before. Basically, episode 201 was censored due to real-life assassination threats on Trey and Matt from a terrorist organization. And truly there is something wrong with our world when a topic is so dangerous to discuss that even Trey and Matt have to step down. When lives are actually at risk by merely mentioning a name. Anyway, on to number one. Don't stop dancing, not being certain of the curtain. <laughs> Time's Arrow. There was just no contest for me. You don't want to end up like your mother now, do you? <laughs> no. I promise, one day this will all be a pleasant memory. I have never seen such a nightmarish, black adult cartoon episode as Time's Arrow. It's artistic and beautiful, but inescapably black. Season 5's Showstopper was a shocking episode too, as we watch Bojack inadvertently beginning to murder his loved ones. Has anyone else ever noticed we get a hallucinogenic episode for every 11th episode of a Bojack season? First an alcohol bender, then a drug bender? Why don't you two sleep this off in our guest room? Oh my god, that mirror is talking to us! Then, watching Beatrice suffering from dementia, as she desperately struggles to obtain some personal peace, and witnessing the horrors of a mind being annihilated from the inside through dementia. A child being trapped within a bitter, hate-filled marriage of verbal abuse. The echoes of one traumatic event through generations of suffering, it's complicated and genuinely upsetting, but very plausible and realistic at the same time. This is one of those adult cartoon episodes that may horrify its audience, but it also sustains that golden standard for adult animation that Bojack often sets. Time's Arrow is like watching someone step into hell, their lifetime of tragedy relentlessly spilling and unraveling on the floor, all stemming from Bojack's grandfather and the ordering of the lobotomy on his wife constantly holding that thread of lobotomy like a knife under the neck of his daughter Beatrice. While I don't think Beatrice's upbringing excuses her terrible treatment of Bojack, this certainly makes her behavior more understandable. Go meet a man, a good man, and you'll have a family, but please believe me, you don't want this. Seeing your loved ones forgetting who you are and losing everything that made you special on the inside, is one of the darkest things I can possibly imagine being portrayed in animation. Then watching that mind reflect back on that life of endless trauma. Although dementia is not an inevitable part of aging, the disease does still affect about 10% of people over 65. But people and technology are fighting to keep up with us as we fortunately get to live longer than ever before. But for now, this strikes a deep nerve with many of those affected. In my opinion, there's no contest. Time's Arrow is the number one darkest adult cartoon episode. Can you taste the ice cream, Mom? Oh, Bojack, it's so delicious. But this dark animation does show us that for the first time ever, Cartoons are now free to discuss every aspect of the human condition. This new adult animation age is helping us discuss openly many of these fears we share. And I believe many of these fears begin to lose their teeth the more we're able to openly discuss them. I'm never going to tell you everything is going to be okay. That's insincere garbage. 
but I will always remind you that you are not alone and that we face this moment together. This one spectacular moment we are sharing together. And if you think I missed a particularly dark adult cartoon episode, feel free to leave your own thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. And a special thanks to patrons DJ Red Hot, Alpha J, Tyler Lublin, Charlie, Mercedes, Faye 206, Amber Burkett, Yorick Bisset, Jonathan Booth, Red Fox 335, The Crimson Mayhem, Gabby Z, Scourge Darkpaw, and of course, Iron Biohazard 03.